starting this video, we're going to go ahead and look at the code of canon law, which comes from the Vatican. That is Book 5. The temporal goods of the church. Liber vide bonus ecclesiae temporalibus. It states in Canon 1254, 1. To pursue its proper purposes, the Catholic Church, by innate right, is able to acquire, retain, administer, and alienate temporal goods independently from civil power. Isn't that interesting? In the first declaration, they're stating that they can basically acquire things regardless of any sort of sovereign sovereignty that might exist. Unless, of course, the civil power they're talking about has to do with a UN-controlled subsidiary. The proper purposes, this is to, to order divine worship, to care for the decent support of the clergy and other ministers, and to exercise works of the sacred apostate, apostolate, and of charity, especially toward the needy. Canon 1255. The universal church and the ap apostolic see, the particular churches, as well as any other juridic person, public or private, are subjects capable of acquiring, retaining, administering, and alienating temporal goods according to the norm of law. Now, what's interesting about that is that it states that they are subjects, like a subject of a king. 1256. Under the supreme authority of the Roman pontiff, ownership of good belongs to that juridic person which has acquired them legitimately. Now, that's fairly vague, because I expect their idea of legitimacy is probably very different from, say, the U.S. Constitution. 1257. 1. All temporal goods which belong to the Universal Church, the Apostolic See, or other juridic persons in the Church are ecclesiastical goods and are governed by the following canons and their own statutes. The temporal goods of a private juridic person are governed by its own statutes, but not these canons unless other provisions, other provision is expressly made. 1258. The following canons, the term church, signifies not only the universal church or the apostolic see, but also any public juridic person in the church, unless it is otherwise apparent in the context or nature of the matter. So that means that you could have a public juridic person of Hindu nature within this universal church. Title one: the acquisition of goods. The church can acquire temporal goods by every just means of na natural or positive law permitted to others. 1259. 1260. The church has an innate right to require from the Christian faithful those things which are necessary for the purposes proper to it. 1261. The Christian faithful are free to give temporal goods for the benefit of the church. To the diocesan bishop is bound to admonish the faithful of the obligation mentioned in 2221 and in an appropriate manner to urge its observance. So, obviously, what they're talking about here is direct imposition of taxation, obviously without representation, but the idea of a church going around and directly taxing people makes the stomach turn. 1262. The faithful are to give support to the church by responding to appeals and according to the norms issued by the conference of bishops. Isn't that interesting? That's a an order, basically. It's not a suggestion. It's saying that they are to give. Not must give, should give. Well, must would be the same thing, but not should or or not are free to, just are to give. So it makes you wonder how exactly they carry out that order. 
1263, after the diocesan bishop has heard the finance council and the presbyterial council, he has the right to oppose a moderate tax for the needs of the diocese upon public juridic persons subject to his governance. Isn't that interesting? This tax is to be proportionate to their income. He is permitted only to impose an extraordinary and moderate exaction upon other physical and juridic persons in case of grave necessity and under the same conditions. Notice there it states physical persons. It's possibly one of the first times that I've seen that word used. Physical persons. It makes you wonder if that is the natural person that is alluded to in other similar codes and articles. Which obviously I'll ignore the, the main constitutions and whatnot. Without prejudice to particular laws and customs which attribute greater rights to him. So, it's without prejudice to laws and customs that attribute greater rights. So if there's laws and customs that attribute lesser rights, then it is with prejudice against them, according to that line there. 1264, unless the law has provided otherwise, it is for a meeting of the bishops of the province to fix the fees for acts of executive power granting a favor or for the execution of rescripts of the apostolic see to be approved by the apostolic see itself to set a limit on the offerings on the occasion of the administration of sacraments and sacramentals 1265 one without prejudice to the right of religious mendicants any private person whether physical or juridic is forbidden to beg for alms for any pious or ecclesiastical institute or purpose without the written permission of that person's own ordinary and of the local ordinary. So what's interesting about that is that if somebody is a poor beggar, they have to go and get permission from the church to go and beg. Interesting. I wonder what the methods they use to enforce these codes are. The Conference of Bishops can establish norms for begging for alms, which all must observe, including those who by their foundation are called and are mendicants. In all churches and oratories which are in fact habitual open habitually open to the Christian faith, including those which belong to religious institutes, the local ordinary can order the taking up of a special collection for special specific parochial diocesan national or universal subjects. This collection must be diligently sent afterwards to the diocesan curia. That's an interesting part there. Basically laying out different type of subjects. The last one, universal subject, is really interesting. 1267, unless the contrary is established, offerings given to superiors or administrators of any ecclesiastical juridic person, even a private one, are presumed given to the juridic person itself. The offerings mentioned in SS1, cannot be refused except for a just cause, and in matters of greater importance if it concerns a public juridic person, with the permission of the ordinary, the permissions of the same ordinary is required to accept offerings burdened by a modal obligation or condition without prejudice to the prescript of Canon 1295. Offerings given by the faithful for a certain purpose can be applied only for that same purpose. 1268. The church recognizes prescription as a means of acquiring temporal goods and freely and freeing oneself from them, according to the norm of Canon 197 199. 1269. If sacred objects are privately owned, private persons can acquire them through prescription, but it is not permitted to employ them for profane uses unless they have lost the dedication or blessing if they belong to a public ecclesiastical juridic person. However, only another public ecclesiastical juridic person can acquire them. 1270. If they belong to the apostolic see, immovable property, precious movable objects, and personal or real rights and actions are prescribed by a period of a hundred years if they belong to another public ecclesiastical juridic person, they are prescribed by a period of 30 years. 
So that's sort of giving you some idea about how the theft of objects of value takes place. 1271. By reason of the bond of unity and charity, and according to the resources of their diocese, bishops are to assist in procuring those means which the apostolic see needs, according to the conditions of the times, so that it is able to offer service properly to the universal church. In regions where benefices, properly so-called, still exist, it is for the conference of bishops through appropriate norms agreed to and approved by the apostolic see to direct the governance of such benefices in such a way that the income, and even in so far as possible the endowment itself, of the benefices are gradually transferred to the institute mentioned in Canon 1274. 1. Title 2. The Administration of Goods. Canon 1273 through 1289. 1273. By virtue of his primacy of governance, the Roman pontiff is the supreme administrator and steward of all ecclesiastical goods. Notice that. It states all ecclesiastical goods. All they have to do according to their own laws, which they wrote themselves, of course, is acquire goods and put them into these juridic entities and whatnot. And then according to their laws, they will not recognize any any laws of any other place on the planet the universal church it's their stuff and they claim it all everything canon 1274 each diocese is to have a special institute which is to collect goods or offerings for the purpose of providing according to the norm of canon 281 for the support of clerics who offer service for the benefit of the diocese unless provision is made for them in another way 2. Where social provision for the benefit of clergy has not yet been suitably arranged, the Conference of Bishops is to take care that there is an institute which provides sufficiently for the social security of clerics. Insofar as necessary, each diocese is to establish a common fund through which bishops are able to satisfy obligations towards other persons who serve the church and meet the various needs of the diocese and through which the richer dioceses can also assist the poorer ones. According to different local circumstances, the purposes mentioned in 2 and 3 can be obtained more suitably through a federation of diocesan institutes, through a cooperative endeavor, or even through an appropriate association established for various dioceses or for the entire territory of the Conference of Bishops. If possible, these institutes are to be established in such a way that they also have recognition in civil law. An aggregate of goods which come from different dioceses is administered according to the norms appropriately agreed upon by the bishops concerned. 1276. It is for the ordinary to exercise careful vigilance over the administration of all the goods which belong to public juridic persons subject to him, without prejudice to legitimate titles which attribute more significant rights to him. Here again we get a, a mention of, of having prejudice to the things that administer lesser or less significant in this context less significant rights two with due regard for rights legitimate customs and circumstances ordinaries are to take care of the ordering of the entire matter of the administration of the ecclesiastical goods by issuing special instructions with lim the limits of universal and particular law they love all of this universal declaration that goes on here <laughs> 1277, the diocesan bishop must hear the finance council and college of consultors to place acts of administration which are more important in light of the economic condition of the diocese. In addition to the cases specially expressed in universal law or the charter of a foundation, however, he needs the consent of the finance council and the college of consultors to place acts of extraordinary administration. It is for the conference of bishops to define which acts are to be considered extraordinary administration. 1278. In addition to the functions mentioned in Canon 494, 3 and 4, the diocesan bishop can entrust to the finance officer the functions mentioned in Canon 1276 and 1279. The administration of ecclesiastical goods pertains to the one who immediately governs the person to which the goods belong, unless particular law, statutes, or legitimate customs determine otherwise, and without prejudice to the rights of the ordinary to intervene in case of negligence by an administrator. 
In the administration of the goods of a public juridic person, which does not have its own administrators by law, the charter of the foundation or its own statutes, the ordinary to whom it's, it is subject is to appoint suitable persons for three years. The same persons can be reappointed by the ordinary. Each juridic person is to have its own finance council, or at least two counselors who, according to the norm of the statutes, are to assist the administrators in fulfilling his or her function. Without prejudice to the prescripts of the statutes, administrators invalidly place acts which exceed the limits and manner of ordinary administration unless they have first obtained a written faculty from the ordinary. The statutes are to define the acts which exceed the limit and power of ordinary administration. If the statutes are silent in this regard, however, the diocesan bishop is competent to determine such acts for the person subject to him after having heard the finance council. So it appears that these bishops are more like regents and the ordinaries are kind of like the oversight of the regents. <laughs> That's what it sounds like anyway. Unless and to the extent that it is to its own advantage, a juridic person is not bound to answer for acts invalidly placed by its administrators. A juridic person itself, however, will answer for acts illegitimately but validly placed by its administrators without prejudice to its right of action or recourse against the administrators who have damaged it. So, basically, they don't trust any of their minions, and if any of their minions do something that they don't like, then they're going to send their other minion of fictitious uh, existence, the juridic person, against their physical minion, which is the person that is only there to occupy that position and serves no other purpose. Just basically, humans are essentially cannon fodder. 1282. Ha ha ha, cannon fodder. <laughs> All clerics or lay persons who take part in the administration of ecclesiastical goods by a legitimate title are bound to fulfill their functions in the name of the church according to the norm of law. Canon 1283, before administrators begin their function, they must take an oath before the ordinary or his delegate that they were, will administer well and fully. They are to prepare and sign an accurate and clear inventory of immovable property, movable objects, whether precious or of some culture, cultural value or other goods, with the description and appraisal, any inventory already done is to be reviewed. One copy of this inventory is to be preserved in the archive of the administration and another in the archive of the curia. Any change which the patrimony happens to undergo is to be noted in each copy. And naturally, they wouldn't have any of these copies available to people that are outside of their direct and immediate control. I bet those lists are very interesting. 1284. All administrators are bound to fulfill their function with the diligence of a good householder. Consequently, they must exercise vigilance so that the goods entrusted to their care are in no way lost or damaged, taking out insurance policies for this purpose in so far as necessary, take care of the take care that the ownership of ecclesiastical goods is protected by civilly valid methods. Not constitutionally valid methods, of course, because the US Constitution forbids most of this stuff. So they wouldn't recognize that. Observe the prescripts of both canon and civil law are those imposed by a founder, a donor, or a legitimate authority, and especially be on guard that no damage comes to the church from the non-observance of civil laws. Collect the return of goods. Uh, well, that one before is also very interesting. It's specifically stipulating that don't get caught, basically. Collect the return of goods and the income accurately and on time. Protect what is collected and use them according to the Intention of the function, founder, and legitimate norms. Foundation and legitimate norm. Pay at the stated time the interest due on a loan or mortgage and take care that the capital debt itself is repaid in a timely manner. With the consent of the ordinary, invest the money which is left over after expenses and be usefully set aside for the purposes of the juridic person. Keep well-organized books of receipts and expenditures. Drop a report of the administration at the end of each year. Organize correctly and 
protect in suitable and proper archive the documents and records on which the property rights of the church or the institute are based and deposit authentic copies of them in the archive of the curia when it can be done conveniently of course this that section basically is stating that you don't you only need the documentation that proves possession of this universal church and all of the documentation about ownership can be destroyed It is strongly recommended that the administrators prepare budgets of incomes and expenditures each year. It is left to particular law, however, to require them and to determine more precisely the ways in which they are to be presented. Within the limits of ordinary administration only, administrators are permitted to make donations for purposes of piety or Christian charity for movable goods which do not belong to the stable patrimony. Administrators of goods. The employment of workers are to observe meticulously also the civil laws concerning labor and social policy according to the principles handed on by the church. Are to pay a just and decent wage to employees so that they are able to provide fittingly for their own needs and those of their dependents. Both clerical and lay administrators of any ecclesiastical goods, whatever which have not been legitimately exempted from the power of governance, of the diocesan bishop are bound by their office to present an annual report to the local ordinary who is to present it for examination by the finance council any contrary custom is reprobated according to norms to be determined by particular law administrators are to render an account to the faithful concerning the goods governed by the faithful to the church 1288 Administrators are neither to initiate nor to contest litigation in a civil forum in the name of a juridic, public juridic person unless they have obtained the written permission of their own ordinary. Even if not bound but to the administration by the title of an ecclesiastical office, administrators cannot relinquish their function on their own initiative. The church is harmed from an arbitrary withdrawal. Moreover, they are bound to restitution. So isn't that kind of interesting? That sounds like that blood in, blood out type of deal that gangs are known to impose alleged gangs gangs just mean groups so i guess you could just say criminal organizations but who's crime right very confusing stuff title three contracts and especially alienation 1290 the general and particular provisions which the civil law in a territory has established for contracts and their disposition are to be observed with the same evex in canon law, and so far, I'm not sure, I think that's a typo there. Insofar as the matters are subject to the power of governance of the church, unless provisions are contrary to divine law or canon law, provides otherwise, and without prejudice to the prescript of canon 1547. 1291. The permission of the authority competent according to the norm of law is required for the valid alienation of goods, which constitute by legitimate designation the stable patrimony of a public juridic person and whose value exceeds the sum defined by law which law though like how you have all these documents that always state by law as if there's only one law there isn't there are more than one law this is although when it comes to the u.s constitution it states that it is the supreme law of the land so there's that Canon 1292, without prejudice to the prescription of Canon 638, when the value of the goods whose alienation is proposed falls within the minimum and maximum amounts to be defined by the Conference of Bishops for its own region, the competent authority is determined by the statutes of juridic persons if they are not subject to the diocesan bishop. Otherwise, the competent authority is the diocesan bishop with the consent of the Financial Council, the College of Consultors, and those concerned diocesan bishop himself also needs their consent to alienate the goods of the diocese. The permission of the Holy See is also required for the valid alienation of goods whose value exceeds the maximum amount. Goods given to the church by value are goods precious for artistic or historical reasons. If the asset to be alienated is divisible, the parts already alienated must be mentioned when seeking permission for the alienation Otherwise, the permission is invalid. Those who, by advice or consent, must take part in alienation 
alienating goods are not to offer advice or consent unless they have first been thoroughly informed both of the economic state of the juridic person whose goods are proposed for alienation and of previous alienations. 1293. The alienation of goods whose value exceeds the defined minimum amount also requires the following. Just cause, such as urgent necessity, evident advantage, piety, charity, or some other grave pastoral reason. So there we get a mention of that word there, pastoral. A written appraisal by experts of the asset to be alienated. Other precautions prescribed by legitimate authority also to be observed to avoid harm to the church. 1294. An asset ordinarily must be alienated for a price less than that indicated in the appraisal. The money received from the alienation is either to be invested carefully for the advantage of the church or to be expended prudently according to the purposes of the alienation. The requirements of Canon 1291 through 1294, to which the statutes of juridic persons must also conform, must be observed not only in alienation but also in any transaction which can worsen the patrimonial condition of a juridic person. Whenever ecclesiastical goods have been alienated without the required canonical formalities, but the alienation is valid civilly, it is for the competent authority, after having considered everything thoroughly, to decide whether and what type of action, namely personal or real, is to be instituted by whom and against whom in order to vindicate the rights of the church. Now that's an interesting passage there. It's very convoluted, and usually when they write something extremely convoluted that they're trying to hide it. Basically just talking about who's going to take action in a particular circumstance. 1297. Attentive to local circumstances, it is for the conference of bishops to establish norms for the leasing of church goods, especially regarding the permission to be obtained from competent ecclesiastical authority. Now you, now you get that. Competent ecclesiastical authority. That completely bypasses any any court system, really. A any any uh, Anything that's not an ecclesiastical authority. And then it has to be competent. And I'm sure that the only competent ecclesiastical authorities are the ones they appoint. 1298. Unless an asset is of little value, ecclesiastical goods are not to be sold or leased to the administrators of those goods or to their relatives up to the fourth degree of consanguinity or affinity without the special written permission of competent authority. Now, here's an interesting part there. Something sanguine, or the word sanguine, has to do with blood, sangre. So, consanguinity, I wonder if that has to do something with, with um, a blood signature. And then affinity is also used there in a really interesting way. Fourth degree of consanguinity or affinity. Canon 12. Well, this is Title 4, Pious Wills in General and Pious Foundations. Canon 1299 through 1310. 1299. A person who by natural law and canon law is able to... is a, able freely to depose of his or her goods can bestow goods for pious causes either through an act inter vivos or through an act mortis causa. In it, dispositions of mortis causa for the good of the church, the formalities of civil law are to be observed if possible. If possible. If they have been omitted, the heirs must be admonished regarding the obligation to which they are bound of fulfilling the intention of the testator. Canon 1300, the legitimately accepted wills of the faithful who give their, who give or leave their resources for pious causes, whether through an act inter vivos or through an act mortis causa, are to be fulfilled most diligently even regarding the manner of administration and distribution of goods without prejudice to the prescript of Canon 1301. Now, before I go on with this part, I could imagine a scheme taking place like the one in in Gladiator, where a person is killed and then their will lied about. And considering all of these things that these people do, and their declarations of universal charges and all this other stuff, I wouldn't put it past them to 
fudge some paperwork so that they can acquire something that they believe is their property. Canon 1301. The ordinary is the executor of all pious wills, whether mortis causa or inter vivos. By this right, the ordinary can and must exercise vigilance, even through visitation, so that the pious so that pious wills are fulfilled and other executors are bound to render him an account after they have performed their function. Stipulations contrary to this right of an ordinary attached to last wills and testaments are to be considered non-existent. That interesting. Are there any stipulations are going to be considered non-existent? A person who has accepted goods and trust for pious causes either through an act inter vivos or by a last will and testament must inform the ordinary of the trust and indicate to him its movable and immovable goods with the obligations attached to them. If the donor is expressly and entirely prohibited this, however, the person is not to accept the trust. The ordinary must demand that goods be held in trust are safeguarded and also exercise vigilance for the execution of the pious will according to norm of canon 1301. When goods held in trust have been entrusted to a member of a religious institute or society of apostolic life, and if the goods have also been designated for some place or diocese or for the assistance of their inhabitants of pious co or pious causes, the ordinary mentioned in 1 and 2 is the local ordinary. Otherwise, it is the major superior in a clerical institute of pontifical rite and in clerical societies of apostolic life of pontifical right or the proper ordinary of the members in other religious institutes. 1303. In law, again, it's only mentioning one law, in law, in general, I suppose it would be a, a good thing to add would be in general. The term pi pious foundations includes, or I guess this in law would be their law, Autonomous pious foundations, that is, aggregates of things, universitates rerum, destined for the purposes mentioned in Canon 114, and erected as a juridic person by competent ecclesiastical authority. Non-autonomous pious foundations, that is, temporal goods given in some way to a public juridic person with the obligation for a long time to be determined by a particular law of celebrating masses and performing other specified ecclesiastical functions, or of otherwise pursuing the purposes mentioned in Canon 114 from the annual revenues. If the goods of a non-autonomous pious foundation have been entrusted to a juridic person subject to a diocesan bishop, they must be remanded to the institute mentioned in Canon 1274. 1. When the time is completed, unless some other intention of the founder has been expressly manifested, Otherwise, they accrue to the juridic person itself. 1304. For a juridic person to be able to accept a foundation validly, the written permission of the ordinary is required. He is not to grant this permission before he has legitimately determined that the juridic person can satisfy both the new obligation to be undertaken and those already undertaken. Most especially, he is to be on guard so that the revenues completely respond to the attached obligations according to the practice of each place or region. Now, here's an interesting part before we go on to 2 of 1304. 2 of the previous one states that if the good... I already read this part, so I'm going to read it again. If the goods of non-autonomous pious foundation have been entrusted to a juridic person subject to a di diocesan bishop, they must be remanded to the institute mentioned in Canon 1274. So that is telling you that's a money laundering scheme. That's saying that if if this goes from one place to another, then it will go to this other place over here as well, automatically. And this is completed unless some other intention of the founder has been expressly manifested. Otherwise, they accrue to the juridic person itself. So, if there is a intention of the founder that has been expressly manifested, then it will accrue to the juridic person. So, it's stating that in in one case it will go over here and in another case it will go over here it's basically just a money laundering particular law is to define additional conditions for the establishment and acceptance of foundations money and movable goods assigned to an endowment are to be deposited immediately in a safe place approved by the ordinary so that the money or value of the movable goods is protected as soon as possible 
These are to be invested cautiously and usefully for the benefit of the foundation. With the express and specific mention made of the obligation, this advancement is to be made according to the prudent judgment of the ordinary after he has heard those concerned and his own finance counsel. Now, of course, the word they're not going to use here is theft. But this is telling you that these people are robbers and thieves. And what they steal, they have to immediately move to protect it. You don't honest, usually have to do that with legitimately acquired assets. You don't have to do it, quote, as soon as possible. And to be invested cautiously. All of this, this part in this paragraph is coded language to describe protection of uh, protection of theft or property that has been thieved basically Ken 1306 foundations even if made orally are to be put in writing one copy of the charter is to be preserved safely in the archive of the Curia and another copy in the archive of the Dritic person to which the foundation belongs a list of the obligations incumbent upon pious foundations is to be composed and displayed in an accessible place so that the obligations to be filled are not for forgotten. Prescripts of Canon 1300 to 1302 and 1287 are to be observed. In addition to the book mentioned in Canon 958, one, another book is to be maintained and kept by the pastor or rector in which the individual obligations, their fulfillment, and the offerings are noted. A reduction of the obligations of masses to be made only for just and necessary cause is reserved to the apostolic see without prejudice to the following prescripts. If it is expressly provided for in the charters of the foundations, the ordinary is able to reduce the mass obligations because of diminished revenues. With regarded, regard to masses independently founded in legacies or in any other way, the diocesan bishop has the power because of diminished revenues and for as long as the cause exists to reduce the obligations to the level of offering legitimately established in the diocese, provided that there is no one, no one obliged to increase the offerings who can effectively be made to do so. The diocesan bishop also has the power to reduce the obligations or legacies of masses binding an ecclesiastical institute if the revenue has become insufficient to pursue appropriately the proper purpose of the institute. The Supreme Moderator of a Clerical Religious Institute of Pontifical Rite possesses the same powers mentioned in 3 and 4. The authorities mentioned in Canon 1308 also have the power to transfer for an appropriate cause the obligations of masses, today's churches, or others different from those determined in the foundations. The ordinary, only for just and necessary cause, can reduce, moderate, or commute wills of the faithful for pious causes if the founder has expressly entrusted this power to him. If, through no fault of the administrators, the fulfillment of the imposed obligations has become impossible because of the diminished revenues or some other cause, the ordinary can equitably lessen these obligations after having heard those concerned and his own finance counsel and the intention of the founder preserved as much as possible, this does not hold for the reduction of masses, which is governed by the prescripts of Canon 1308. In other cases, recourse is to be made to the Apostolic See. So, when we go to Google, and uh, we find out that there's a lot of different words that they use for moving around assets and property and things like that. Classic tactics of any sort of legitimate money launderer. <laughs> legitimate. <laughs> what are ecclesiastical goods? Ecclesiastical goods, sometimes referred to as an ecclesiastical property, are the temporal goods, assets, belonging to a public juridic person such as a diocese, parish, religious institute, or a ministerial public juridic person that are required to carry out a specific mission. 